Hey guys, Rich from Rich Me Gaming. Hope everyone is doing fantastically well. Welcome to this, the second episode in our beginner's guide for Star Wars Shatterpoint, where we take the newly released rulebook and we break it down into a video format, hopefully making it easier for some of you out there who just prefer to consume content in this kind of way. Um, in the last episode, we went through how to build your very first strike team. So if you haven't checked that one out, go check that one out. Uh, it's not essential before you watch this, but I'd go check that one out first and then come back to this one. Um, in this video, we're going to go through everything else you need to do to get the game set up from the actual order in which we do things to preparing the battlefield right through to who gets priority and how do we determine that um, and everything else you need to know as you go into your very first game of Star Wars Shatterpoint plus some hints and tips along the way if you are choosing to do some of these things with third party pieces of terrain and such things plus a couple of my thoughts on some of the rules that you can maybe bend and you'll probably see being bent uh, at uh, events and tournaments and other such things. So let's jump straight into it. Guys, a quick reminder before we do get into game setup that we are giving away a Star Wars Shatterpoint core box. If you want to be with a chance to win this core box, uh, you need to hang around till the end of the video and find out exactly how you can be with a chance of winning. So with all that done, let's jump into game setup. And the first thing that we need to do, um, or, or once we've done our strike team, that's the whole premise behind this, we've built our strike teams, we're turning up, we're sitting down to play a game against our opponent. Um, and the first thing we need to do is determine which of us is going to be the first player. Now for anyone that's played Marvel Crisis Protocol, it's going to be somewhat similar, but if you're coming for something like Star Wars Legion, it's quite different. So um, it has nothing to do with the number of points that you're bringing or anything like that. It is a simple dice roll off. So each player will roll five attack dice. Remember, they're the eight sided um, gray dice that we've got. And basically, whoever rolls the most crits uh, becomes player one. They become the first player. Now, if players roll an equal number of crits, then we move to strikes, and it'll be the player with the most strikes in their roll. Um, if the crits and the strikes are the same, well, it's a re-roll. Um, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, I think two or three is the most times I've ever happened, or had it happen, sorry, in uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol. But um, yeah, it's a very simple, straightforward, easy way to work out which player is going to be the first player or player with priority. So there's a couple of things that the first player needs to decide. Uh, number one is which of the board edges they want to deploy on. Now, that's less important than you may think um, if you actually stick to the letter of the rules. Could be more important if you're at an event where terrain has already been set up, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, and the second thing is they need to choose which mission set they're going to use. Now, if you remember from our Building the Strike Team video, each player is going to bring their own mission set. And the first player, or the player with priority, is going to choose which of those two sets are going to be used. Now, it has to be a set in hull, so you can't pick and choose different cards from different sets. So they either get to use their own, or they get to use their opponent. Now, you may be thinking, well, you're always going to choose your own. It may be that your opponent has some cards that you've never played before and you'd just like to try them out. So it gives you that flexibility. As we mentioned before, it doesn't really matter right now because everyone's going to be carrying the same mission set. But moving forward, that is something they will have to choose. Okay, so we've um, picked who's going to be the first player. Now that first player needs to set up the mission. Uh, so if you remember, we've got that mission map card, and we'll go through that in a second. But the mission deck is going to be made up of one of each of the phase cards. One phase one, one phase two, one phase three. So we take each three of these cards, um, we separate them into their different piles. So the three phase one cards, the three phase two cards, and the three phase three cards. We give them a shuffle. We pick one at random from each pile and then that creates our uh, mission deck for this particular game or our struggle or phase deck. Now once those uh, phase cards have been chosen and put face down, we take a look at the actual mission card itself. Uh, this one is going to be shifting priorities because that's the only one that we've got. You can see I've overlaid it on here. And we need to make sure that we put down objective tokens in each of the spaces denoted by the map in that mission set. Um, little note there for everyone that this is being played on a three foot 
by three foot table. That could be a mat, it could be a purpose built board, but it is important that you get a board that is at least within a couple of millimeters of that, because you'll notice there that we've used our deployment tools, so range four and range five in this particular one, uh, for the actual deployment of it. So if you look at a board that's four foot by three foot or something like that and try and deploy from different sides it isn't going to work so we need to make sure that we're working within that three foot by three foot space and lastly is the deployment sorry the objective tokens are double sided they've got an active side which is yellow and inactive which is black for the moment we need to make sure that we keep all of these on the black side now, something that I haven't seen in other games previously, and this is the, the part now where I think it's going to get a little bit interesting, is right up until this point, there was no terrain deployed on the board. Um, but before we get into that, let's take a look at the terrain that's out there. So the core box itself comes with a huge amount of terrain, probably enough to at least play a few games. And from what I've seen and what I've been told, there's a couple of different configurations uh, that this is going to be able to, to make. Um, so you've got gantries in there, you've got the sort of different buildings, so on and so forth. And then they've already announced the take cover terrain pack. So you've got some more sort of little rocky outcrops in there as well. Some more ladders and things that will be very important. And we'll get into them in a moment as well. I think there's even a little speed bike in there. And then you've got the high ground one. I do like this one. So all of these combined is going to be more than enough uh, to make your own boards. But if you're anything like me, you like to do some scratch building stuff. I am at the moment um, sort of toying with multiple ideas. I am keep bumping from street level Corazon through to I've been playing through Fallen Order and I saw the uh, Imperial base on Kashyyyk and I'm all in now on an Imperial base in Kashyyyk. So I'll get there eventually. I'll decide what it is I'm making. But you may want to use or build your own terrain. You may want to get third party terrain, whether it be 3D printed, whatever it may be. But there's a couple of things I want to go through that... I would say are things you may want to consider if you are going to use unofficial terrain uh, for Star Wars Shatterpoint. Now, the first one is going to be elevation relativity. Now, we're not going to go do a deep dive into elevation in this video. It's its own separate video completely. But all you need to know is elevation is really, really important in this game, more so than um, Star Wars uh, Legion. I think Star Wars Legion and also Marvel Crisis Protocol as well, because it really determines where characters can and can't move um, unobstructed. So you'll notice the little range two marker next to Gar Saxon there. That's the smaller one to the right hand side. Um, all of the AMG uh, provided terrain is going to be range two or higher and the reason for that is um, elevation relativity everyone's elevation zone is from the bottom of their base to a maximum of range two so anything below range two or range two and below they're going to be able to traverse unimpeded so they'll be able to do a full advance anything above that then they need to use either a climb or a jump or something else to be able to get to that terrain now it's also worth noting that if you are doing a climb or a jump um, then there's no limit so you can traverse multiple uh, elevation uh, sort of zones at once. Um, but just something to bear in mind when you are looking at third party terrain. I would say especially third party terrain that has been designed for Star Wars Legion. Typically at 28 to sort of 32 mil scale. You may want to ask whoever's 3D printing it um, just to boost that up a little bit. So it's maybe more 40 to 45 mil scale. Uh, the other thing when we're talking about scale are the base sizes in the game itself. So most of the characters are going to come on and I'm saying 35 to 40 mil because I've heard conflicting stories from Adepticon and uh, Star Wars Celebration. Some people were saying 40, some people were saying 35, but 35 to 40 millimeters that most of the characters are on. But you also then have these larger bases uh, that are 50 millimeters. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important that if you have terrain, you need to make sure that the characters that you've got, or the terrain that you've got, sorry, is going to be wide enough in certain places for these bases to be able to actually stand on top of there. Um, I wanted to show this example here. 
Uh, this is taken from the uh, core rulebook itself. It's actually nothing to do with elevation, this one. Uh, sorry, nothing to do with uh, the base sizes, but you can see here that Kalani um, is stood atop a building and is only just fitting on there. So there's absolutely no chance that these B1 battle droids are going to be able to fit up there. Now, if that's been designed in that way, then that's absolutely fine. However, you need to make sure that you've got accessibility for different types of base sizes because if we look here, what's called overlapping, so where either, uh, well, basically where a base is overlapping a piece of terrain so it isn't fully on there, that isn't allowed in the game. Even though they showed it in some of the videos and things, it isn't allowed in the game. So just something else to take into consideration again especially if you are looking at using old star wars legion terrain and repurposing it um because the base sizes are significantly uh, bigger in um shatter point than they are than they are in uh, star wars legion Next thing I wanted to talk about really quickly when it comes to terrain is clear and blocked terrain. Now, again, we're going to go into more detail with this um, in, a, in a future video, but it's something to take into consideration when you're building terrain yourself or when you're buying, buying third party terrain. Um, and it's something that you need to choose and decide at the beginning of a game and agree with your opponent. Now, some of them are going to be really simple and straightforward. So we've got uh, Ahsoka stood behind a ladder here. That ladder clearly has visibility running through it. And while she may get some cover and some additional dice, no one would argue that Gar Saxon is going to be able to shoot up uh, at Ahsoka Tano there. Equally, uh, we've got, um, I think this is one of the Mandalorians stood behind this building, but you can clearly see that is a that is a blocked building. A character stood at one side of it isn't going to be able to see a character at the other side of it. However, there are some pieces of terrain in this pack, even in the core box, um, that have been designed in such a way that whilst at first glance they may see like they're blocked, but if we look at this gantry here with Maul at the bottom and... Um, I forgot the guy's name now, Anakin Skywalker <laughs> stood atop. Um, they did say that they designed uh, this terrain so that this would be clear, so that um, Darth Maul would be able to do his lightsaber throw and, you know, hit hit Anakin with it. Um, so it's those sorts of things that you need to agree and decide upon before the game starts. And as I mentioned, with the AMG provided terrain, it's really simple and straightforward because, you know, They've already been outlined in videos and people have been talking about it. But when you're looking at third party terrain, um, I think A, you need to make sure you agree it, you agree it. But B, you need to make sure that when you're building these, whether you are an individual building a board at home, whether you're taking it to a gaming centre, or indeed whether you're a gaming centre, you need to make sure that terrain is suitable for the game that you are playing and making sure that you've got these varying blocked clear some with you know some that are, are, are underpasses overpasses all these sorts of things uh, when you are when you're building your boards for star wars shatter point the last thing then i want to talk about around the terrain piece is going to be ingress points so what are ingress points well i mentioned that there are ways that you can um climb up and down terrain pieces that are over range two um, you can use the climb tool you can use a jump if you've got one the other way that you can traverse them is using ingress points typically ingress points have their two points so there'll be a top and there'll be a bottom um, again we're not going to go into all the details here but they're a way of a character being able to traverse a building without having to use any sort of special movement um, so something to consider they show ladders in here you could use elevators you could use ropes you could use anything you want but once again it's something you need to agree with your opponent before you actually start playing the game and then there's absolutely no problems going into it if something happens so you've got all your terrain built and everything else now it's actually time to start creating the battlefield um and this is one where I am not entirely sure on if I'm going to be brutally honest so the order is the order what we've gone through here you deploy the map first, you put your objective points out. At this point, your board is clear other than those nine objective points that we've put out there. Then we get into creating the battlefield. And there's a couple of interesting bits around how that works. So let's just take a look at that real quickly. So let's say that we have deployed the battlefield or all of the terrain, and there is an objective marker that is below a piece of terrain. Well, 
what you need to do is you need to move that to the highest elevation possible. Now, if you move that up an elevation and it is overlapping, um, even if you even if you don't move it up, actually, terrain can't be overlapping these objectives, um, or the objectives can't be overlapping the terrain, should I say? Um, so you need to make sure that they're clearly on there. Um, but you you move it up. So basically, in this example, you've got the sort of little gantry walkway. It started at the bottom. Once we put the terrain out there, it moves to the top. Um, do I think this is a good way of doing it? Um, I like the fact that it has to go to the highest elevation. I do really like that. Um, do I think it makes any sort of sense and is feasible to have a terrain being built after the fact? Um, no, I don't think it is. I think what you're going to find is um, people will be clever with their terrain. People will build them in such a way that it it lends itself to be a good gaming experience for both players, but you're going to be turning up to events and the terrain is already going to be deployed on the battlefield. You may need to, you know, as, as we get new mission sets and those sorts of things, you may need to move them around a little bit. Um, it's a weird rule. I did see that other people said that this isn't the only game where where this happens. Um, personally, I'm not a fan. Uh, I can't imagine doing this. You know, I think it, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, and I think most events... This won't be part of it, but let me know in the comment section below what you guys what you guys think on that one. Um, so that's it. That is our board built. We now need to do all of the actual things before we can get into that first turn. And the first thing we need to do is take that order deck and give it a good old shuffle. So if you remember from the last uh, last video, every uh, every unit that we bring is going to come with a corresponding order. Uh, card. Uh, we take those six cards, so one for each of our primaries, one for each of our secondaries, and one for each of our support units. Remembering, even if a support unit is two characters, so remember we've got units, characters. So even if there's two characters, uh, it's still only going to be one card. And last but not least, obviously that all important Shatterpoint card giving us our uh, our seven cards in total. We give them a shuffle, do it however it is you want to do that, and then put them face down, and that is going to be our order deck that we will be playing with. Then we need to create our will of the force pools, or just force points, which is how people are pretty much referring to them as. So remember then, we've got our two primaries in, in both of our squads. So here we've got Lord Maul, General Anakin, Skywalker. And the number that we're looking at is this four on Anakin and three on Lord Maul, top right hand corner that is going to show us how many force points we've got um, and it's worth pointing out that this is a pool so we take the seven in this example and that is a pool that any of our characters can use now again we're not going to go into a lot of detail around how they're refreshed and everything else but uh, just because anakin brings four doesn't mean that Darth Maul can't utilise some of the four that Anakin brings, or indeed any of the other units in Lord Maul's squad. I keep calling him Darth Maul, I know. Um, also worth pointing out that these have two sides. They've got the um, available side, which is dictated by the sort of yellow outline there. And then they've got the use side. So just a way for you to be able to keep track of how many um, how many force points you've got left uh, for, for the rest of the game. Next up then is we have the struggle tracker. And we need to set this up. This is really simple and straightforward. So we've got the strug struggle token, easy for me to say, that's going to go in the central point on zero. And then we have our initial two momentum tokens, um, both put over the number eight for each character. Um, I don't know, actually, and it doesn't say in the rules who is left and who is who is right. Um, I gather wherever you've put this on the table, it would make sense for, you know, if you were stood on the left-hand side, then you take the left-hand side of the tracker. But, you know, sort it out between yourselves. It's really simple and straightforward. So now we are on to actual deployment of the characters. Now, at this point, you have to remember, we don't, whilst we know where the objectives potentially could be, because we've deployed them already, we don't know which of the phase cards uh, for the first struggle we've actually taken. So we need to think about that, but the rules for deployment are really simple and straightforward. Starting with the first player, so the player that won that roll off, they're going to start with their first squad and they're going to deploy their primary unit within range two of their own battlefield edge. 
From there, they're then going to deploy their secondary and their support unit, uh, both within range one of the primary unit. And remembering that even if you have two characters in your support unit, they are completely autonomous and they don't, there's no, um, there's no uh, rule that says they have to be deployed or indeed stay within X range of each other. From there, your opponent or the second player then deploys their first squad, then the first player deploys their first squad, and then back to the second player to round out and deploy their final squad. Stands cards next, and this isn't going to affect every character right now, it's just going to be the primary, but once both players have deployed all of their squads, they need to choose which stance any character that has a double-sided stance card is going to start the game in. Once again, this happens before we flip over that first struggle card or the first phase one card and see where the objectives are going to be. Um, right now, it's just the primaries in the game, but again, in the future, that could be secondaries as well. Then we get on to mission deployments. This is the map that we had set up previously, obviously with no terrain on there. But you can see at the moment, um, all nine objectives there are on the inactive side. So we take the first um, the first phase card, which is going to be phase one, which in this case is steal the secret plans. You can see the little cross there, or the uh, the five markers where we're going to be turning them into active. So we just flip over the objectives um, and then we know that they are the uh, five points that we're going to be fighting over. And that is it, guys. Once you get to that point, player one takes their turn. Um, remember that you can't score VPs on turn one, but again, we'll get into that at a later date. But that is everything you need to know to set up the, the game and the terrain and everything else for Star Wars Shatterpoint. Um, I hope it's been helpful. If it has, please do leave a like. It really, really does help. And that's just reminding me, we are giving away that Star Wars Shatterpoint core box. So to be with a chance of winning that core box, you need to do three things. You need to make sure that you have um, subscribed to the channel. That's pretty straightforward and obvious. Um, you also need to make sure that you've liked this video and you need to make sure that you leave a, uh, a message on there or a comment on this video as well. Um, and I've been picking different ones for each video. So on this one, let me know your thoughts on those terrain rules. The fact that we set the terrain up after we've picked the objective and it isn't something that's done right at the very beginning of the game. Um, let me know how you feel about that. Is it the way you're going to play it? Are you going to play it differently? What do you expect your local gaming stores to do? Comment down in the comment section below. Uh, and then on the 4th of May, good old Star Wars Day, we will be picking a video at random and then we will be picking a comment at random. So if you want the best chance possible, go back and watch all of our other Shatterpoint videos. Um, there's a question in each of those ones as well, so you will have to go watch through them and you know pick the question out. Um, and let let us know and then as we mentioned on the 4th of May we'll be doing that uh, that prize draw um, we also have a discord up and running go check that out there's a dedicated section there for Star Wars Shatterpoint as you probably gathered now Shatterpoint is going to be uh, a main topic on this channel it's now MCP and Shatterpoint there'll be a couple of other things scattered in there uh, but very much heavily focused on those two and as always guys it leaves me with just enough time to say stay well keep safe and until next time May the force be with you.